This morning we continue on in the second installment of our stewardship sermon series called Standing on the Promises. Before we again stand on these premises, we want to spend some time reminding ourselves that we're already standing on the promises, the promises of God. Last week we talked about God's promise of forgiveness, and it is the first and foremost of God's promises. And out of that promise of forgiveness, all the other promises spring, such as the one we're going to talk about today, the promise of freedom. I'll be using as my text Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And this letter is Paul's impassioned plea to the Galatians to both celebrate and protect their newfound freedom in Jesus Christ. I'll be reading from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and then 13 through 15. Listen now for God's word to us, through these words of St. Paul. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgent, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to understand and celebrate and protect the promised freedom that we have In Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. And may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Freedom. It is the one thing that has defined this country from its inception. It may be the one thing that all of us can agree is at the very heart of the American ideal. The freedom to say what we want. The freedom to gather where we want. The freedom to worship what we want. And the freedom to choose those who would lead us. These precious freedoms are the very fabric of our democracy And we even have the freedom to do what we want, provided it doesn't infringe on the freedom of others and it is within the bounds of the law. We all have some sense of what freedom means in the context of being a citizen in this country. But what does freedom mean in the context of our faith? What are the freedoms that are at the very heart of our heavenly citizenship? How does God's promise of freedom in Jesus Christ work its way into our lives and into the church and out into the world? 
And why does it matter? These are the issues that Paul is dealing with here with the Christians in Galatia. And his fear is not that the Galatians are taking their newfound freedom for granted. His fear is that they're throwing it away altogether. It all began when some of the Jewish believers told some of the Gentile believers, and by some I mean the men, that it was not enough for them just to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They also had to be circumcised. In the Hebrew Scriptures, circumcision is the indelible sign of the covenant that God makes between Abraham and his descendants. It is the sign that they are set apart and chosen and beloved forever. It is the sign that these chosen people are called to live their lives by different rules from everyone else. In the Jewish mindset, circumcision was both a rite of initiation and an all-access pass to the promises of God. Now, in some sense, it makes sense to consider circumcision for these new believers. After all, Peter and all the other disciples had been circumcised, and and Paul himself was circumcised also. For these Jewish believers, perhaps circumcision was, was just the price of admission to become part of the family of God, to join the club, so to speak. And in the light of eternity, maybe they thought it was a small price to pay. Except that it wasn't. Not to Paul. You see, Paul had no room for circumcision and for Jesus. He said there was only room for one or the other. And only one of them could truly make us free. And I'm sure you know which one that is. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Well, what is the yoke of slavery that Paul is referring to here, that they had been freed from, and he was afraid that they were falling back into? Well, it was the slavery of having to follow the Jewish law. That is, the rules and regulations laid down in the Hebrew Scriptures that define one's relationship with God. Rules like being circumcised. Obey these rules, it is said, and you would enjoy God's favor. But disobey these rules, and you would incur God's wrath. Paul knew all too well that this kind of religious legalism was a dead-end street because it depended on the goodness of the person more than the goodness of God. And no one could be good enough, long enough, to ever be sure of their standing before God. Not even Paul, and he was better than most. Even for him, hell and judgment was just the next sin away. When godliness is up to us, Paul knew, the fear of the Lord is easy. It's loving the Lord that becomes hard. But Jesus had changed all that. By his death and resurrection, he freed us from the burden of the law and the burden of ourselves. And he did for us what we could never do. He set us free from having to please God for our survival to getting to please God for the salvation that's been freely given to us. We no longer have to worry about earning God's favor, earning God's grace, because God's grace has been given to us through Jesus Christ. And God's grace is enough. That's why Paul had such a hard time with with these people who were talking about having to be circumcised and believing in Jesus. Because what they were saying was that Jesus wasn't enough. His death wasn't enough. His resurrection wasn't enough. His Holy Spirit 
wasn't enough. And that's why he tells them that if they want to pick up the knife, they first need to let go of everything that Christ has done for them. He says, listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Christ has set us free from from the burden of the law, from the burden of ourselves and having to be good enough, long enough so that we can know that we are in God's loving embrace. But that is not all the freedom that we enjoy in Jesus Christ. It's not just the freedom from the law and the freedom from ourselves. But it's also the freedom for something better. And this is where our notion of freedom often differs from Paul's notion of freedom. For for Paul, freedom was much more than being able to do whatever we want within the bounds of the law. No, for him, true freedom was being able to do what God wants outside of the law. And what does God want us to use our freedom for? For one another. For serving one another. For loving one another. This is what he says. For in Christ Jesus, neither uncircumcision nor circumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is how we continue to be good stewards of this precious gift of freedom that is given us in Jesus Christ. By faith, working through love. By serving one another. By loving one another. By loving our neighbors. And yes, by even trying to love our enemies. Which has perhaps been never more important than it is right now. Friends, the freedoms that we enjoy as citizens of this country are precious and hard won. We ought to cherish and celebrate them. And in just a few weeks, we get to exercise our freedom to choose our leaders by voting for those who we think will best protect and preserve these freedoms for us and for generations to come. It will be a close and contentious election. We may not know for weeks who actually has won. It will be an anxious time for us all. So let us now start to pray for peace. And while we start praying for peace, let us continue to pray for one another. And let us continue to love one another, regardless of which side of the political spectrum we are on. Let us not bite And devour one another. As so many people are doing these days. Because if we do. Then we will lose. No matter what the polls. And the pundits say. For freedom. Christ has set us free. St. Augustine. The great. Fourth century church father. Used to sum up the freedom. That we have in Christ with this simple phrase, love God and do what you like. Come to think of it, that's a pretty good way to sum up this sermon. Just remember to keep those things in the right order.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're glad that you joined us in the sanctuary at Northwest Presbyterian Church. I hope that you found a sustaining and life-giving and challenging word from God. If you liked what you heard, I hope you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on the like button also and the notification icon so you can get uploaded not only the latest services, but other videos that we send during the week. Whether you are from Atlanta or you're watching us from far away, we're glad that you're part of our church family. And I hope to see you back here soon. Until then, take care and God bless.